Hello, this is Mona Tonchev, past president of NCSM, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders, the Reset, Renew, Restore series. Join me and my co-host, John San Giovanni, as we sit down and have conversations with emerging and established leaders about how we can reset for the upcoming school year. Listen as we talk to mathematics leaders who can help us think about resetting what has become status quo these past few years. We will learn about their inspiration, perceptions, insights, and perspective. Listeners, fellow mathematics leaders, if you feel like current math instructional practices or student learning seems stuck or stalled, it's time to hit reset. Hello, listeners. I am Mona Tanchev, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders. This series is about how we are going to reset, renew, and restore as we prepare for the coming school year. That's right, Mona. This series is a chance to think about a a brighter future. It's a chance to think about what has worked and what hasn't, to think about the pressure to catch up, but without taking shortcuts. And we're excited to talk to John Staley this month about rethinking data conversations. Dr. John W. Staley has been involved in mathematics education for over 30 years as a secondary mathematics teacher, district leader, and adjunct professor in schools and universities in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and here in Maryland. During his career, he has presented at state, national, and international conferences, served on many committees and task forces, facilitated workshops and professional development sessions on a variety of topics, and received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Teaching Mathematics and Science. He is also part of the writing team for Catalyzing Change in High School Mathematics, initial, initiating critical conversations from NCTM in 2018. He was also part of the writing team for the Framework for Leadership in Mathematics Education from NCSM in 2020, and is a co-author of the High School Mathematics Lessons to Explore, Understand, and Respond to Social Injustice. He's also the past chair of the U.S. National Commission on Mathematics Instruction, and he continues to serve on several advisory boards. But most importantly, I've had the privilege of working on the NCSM board with John when he served as the NCSM president from 2015 to 2017, and that was a great experience. So welcome, John. We're so glad to have you on the podcast today so we can talk about rethinking data conversations. I was so glad to be here. And yes, Mona serving with you. San Antonio, just man, that conference, big memories. Thank you. So much fun. <laughs> yep. So much fun. Well, John, I've known you for years and I've always admired your work and, and who you are. And um, today we want you just to uh, share some of your your work, your ideas, and and our first question for you that to learn more about is well. Tell us about your listener, or tell our listeners, I should say, about your passion um, and and what are you working on now? Where is your focus in your current work? So my, I'll I'll say my current work sits in two spaces. So it's the day the day work that I do, which is um, supporting schools because I work for a school system. So it's supporting schools um, is working with special projects like a system improvement um, system initiative that looks at improving. Um, teaching and learning and structures for our students in 11 different areas, um, schools and offices and network. It also looks at um, supporting our middle schools and then supporting our high schools with different initiatives there. Um, and so excited about that work, but also really excited about the, the work I do outside of school um, during my, my extra time. I sort of call it my Batman time, <laughs> um, which is, which is, extra work related to um, continue to author. So you re- heard about the high school book. So we got a middle school book coming out soon. Um, I do work with um, supporting the transition years, which are 11th grade through the first two years of um, college with the a math leadership network has been formed th- with doing that work and facilitation through the Dana Center, doing different things like this with sharing with different leadership teams, also co-founding a math program called Math Milestones. So still doing that kind of work that's thinking about how do we go about changing the experiences, changing what's happening and making mathematics more relevant, rich, meaningful for our students as they go from pre-K all the way up into wherever they wanna go post-secondary 
but how do we help change those experiences for our students? Yeah, that's a great thought. That's like a, the, what is that? Like the big, hairy, audacious goal that we have to change yeah. those experiences. And that is what our current series is about, is how math leaders need to hit that sort of a reset button, renew and restore for this coming school year after coming out of, still sort of in it, but yeah. dealing with everything we've dealt with over the past two years with through the pandemic. And so your, your topic of conversation, the rethinking data discussions, how does that connect with the theme of reset, renew and restore? Well, I think when, when you think about it, um, and this has been a, a theme or a thread of um, shifting data conversations for a few years for me now, because um, thinking on the, after these two years, how do we help and support teacher teams? How do we help and support um, anyone that's working with improving the experiences for our students um, and using data? The, the, the thought process of what kind of data do you use? When do you use it? How frequently you, do you use it? Um, are all things we need to think about. There's a couple of questions you have to think about. Um, and John sort of alluded to this when he was sort of doing an introduction. When you think about it, what are some of the things that you need to stop doing in regards to the ways that you go about using data um, and what's embedded in your conversations. What are some things where you're like, you're, okay, hmm, maybe we should continue doing this and continue with the way we're doing it, the way we've been doing it in the last year or so, or maybe prior to the pandemic, um, or we need to do it with some adjustments. So here's some things that we might've still learned over the course of the last two years. And so let's make some adjustments and let's keep using them. And then the, the bigger part is what's some of the new things that we really need to, what have we learned during the pandemic about data and our conversations with, with peers, with those who support teachers in their role? Um, what have we learned that we want to pick up now? and really use as we move forward, especially going into next year. It, I think it really gives us an opportunity to really say, boom, pause, stop, reset. How does this benefit our students? And if it really doesn't, but it's like a checklist thing, how can we put that over on the side and keep it moving and going? Yeah, John, and you, you know, you think about getting data, as folks are loving, in love with math, data should be a natural thing that we use all the time, but it, it's hard to work with and, and we don't always have great training with it. And one of the questions I have for you is, in your experiences, what have you seen done well with data discussions and what have you seen that maybe isn't done so well? So let the done well, um, a couple of things. One, when a supportive environment has been built and developed. So, um, Teachers working with their teams, working with their assistant principals, principals, those at middle schools or high schools that might have department chairs, those in the elementary, you might have a resource teacher or one of you might be the lead teacher sort of leading the conversations that that environment is set and built and established so that you can feel comfortable having conversations around the variety of data that you will discuss. Um, it's not used as this hammer, I got you, but it's used as a flashlight. And this understanding that is sort of like used also in a structure of like a continuous improvement cycle where you know you will continue to have the conversations, your conversations are frequent, um, and your conversations are focused. So when you think about um, the supportive structures and environment, that's a key piece. Um, having a clear purpose and understanding of the goals of the data conversations. Um, so as we come together on a regular basis, and I, I will continue to say that part because um, one of the things I don't think is done as well is when you only have those kind of data conversations after a unit assessment, which might have a lot more space in between it and might be four, five, six weeks, maybe even longer sometimes, and you're just talking about the end of unit and that's your data conversation. So when it's not done well, that's the only time in space where you're having it, hmm, you, you gotta think and step back and think about the frequency of it. Um, when you have data conversations that are more focused in on what the students aren't doing versus what can we learn about 
the results of the data. And a lot of times that's assessment data of some type that people are looking at. Um, then that's, that's something to think about. Shifting that focus from students to those who shifted to what can we as the teachers, the, we as the adults that support teachers, um, then support students. How can we go about shifting that conversation? When people are doing that shift, then those are some good things that are happening. So it's sort of like a catch-22. Um, the other part of it is you you think the data has to, the conversation has to be focusing on assessment type data only when you really need to open up that, that big picture of other types of data that you bring into the conversations. And that might be where you need to start your conversations. Yeah, talking about what data to look at is definitely going to be a big part of it. As I was listening to you, I was taking note of, you know, it's the data. When you talk about data, you're not just talking about, you know, a state assessment or an end of unit assessment. What I'm hearing you say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is you're looking at lots of different pieces of student learning, either like on a on a formative assessment, an exit ticket task like when you say data am i making an assumption that you mean all of those things all those plus dot 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 so i'm thinking of what do you know about your student strengths um and that's a part of a data that's not something where you know don't go out and give them the strength analysis test and and get their strengths but what do you learn about your students and see from their strengths um, what do you learn about your students as far as what they bring with them as far as their family, their culture, their language strengths that they bring into the classroom? So that how can you build from that? Because a lot of the, the data that we tend to look at is this data that is based off of a unit formative. Um, not I won't say a lot of times when you sit down for the data discussions, you're looking at these big chunks of data, unit assessments big quizzes. But Mona, as you mentioned, you got to look at the task. What common tasks that we as a team decide, hey, we want to look at this task because why? This task allows us to look at how my students might bring their strength, especially if I'm looking at strengths from the perspective of, hmm, which mathematical practices are some of my students strong? That's their strength. What math proficiencies are they strong with? And that's the strength. And so I will select tasks and we might, as a team might select tasks to use so that we can help think through how do we build from their strengths to continue their learning of mathematics. I know I like that. One of the things I notice when I'm working with teams um, around data is we, we tend to focus on that end result, which is like a score. So what are your suggestions on sort of modifying those data discussions to shift the focus from the score and deficiencies to what you're talking about in terms of student strengths and capabilities. That's um, one you have to think through. And that's why I said the part about if you only, if the major time that's set aside is unit assessment, data conversations, then how do you rethink that? Um, because even as you were as a teacher team teaching, and if you're solo by yourself, um, you still got a team because every now and then you have to turn on that mirror or use that selfie on the camera and talk to yourself. But um, think about how you use all of the experiences that go throughout the unit to determine what data points you want to pick on, what data points you want to sort of capture for yourself or for your team to look at. So here's what I know about my students. I know about my students' cultures, their family experiences, their lived experience. I know what some of them might do, some of their hobbies, some of their habits. And if in that unit, I have an opportunity to, no, not if, when in that unit, I take the opportunity to connect to a student's lived experience. For example, my daughter was a dancer if I had done something in geometry that relates to rotations or something like that, I might have easily, just for her, connected something to dance and rotation and dance. Well, if that happens to be a task 
that I can then connect to a unit assessment item later on, I want to gather information about how does she engage in that task. I want to gather information as we, so I want to identify some tasks, some exit tickets, some key markers throughout the unit that allow me to pull on student strengths. Um, because I'm not just looking at what was the score, what was the mathematics that put on the paper, but how did they go about engaging in the work? Um, how do I, I, does that allow me to help build and continue to build from their strengths? So. Yeah, John, you know, as you're thinking about, or as you're talking, I'm thinking about how stakeholders are involved and, and teachers and teams are involved in this process. And, you know, we've all been in experiences where, where teachers and staff members are reluctant to participate or because it's so infrequent, as you mentioned, you know, and it's not owned by the team or, or for all teachers. So I guess the question I have for you is how do leaders get all stakeholders involved in those data discussions? You keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying. Um, and I say that, but here's the part to think about, and this is why, um, the stakeholders probably sometimes step in and step out or feel disconnected from it. It's, I think it's a, a, a matter of the frequency of how often you have data conversations and discussions, um, the type of data that you bring into the conversation. Um, and also if in that conversation was, did anything come out of it that helps me as the teacher or me as the support team or me as an administrator with helping students? So if I, every time we sit down and meet, I walk away with nothing because nothing really was shared. All we sort of focused in on was what students couldn't do or something along those lines, then, okay, I could have done that talking in my room to myself. But if we come together in a collaborative structure is set, an environment where, hey, Mona, I, I realized that, wow, your students, when we look at student samples of work, so analyzing data um, from multiple choice, student produced responses, selected responses that are all digital, sometimes analyzing digital data, and I call it digital data because it's collected, you get a report and all that kind of stuff, doesn't allow you sometimes to see that, man, that student who is an artist that you realize he likes to draw, he's starting to put that down on his paper. Oh, how can you help him move him with that strength? So when you bring teacher teams together and you give them some takeaways, you help them develop some of the takeaways. John, you mentioned sometimes they just, the, the buy-in and the ownership is not there. You give the data conversation and you help them with the structure and the goals and the expectations because the expectation should be after this data conversation, what can I take back to my classroom to help support some of my students. If I have support people that are coming in, and we all probably have some kind of support person who's coming in and some avenue to work with teachers, work with students, what can they do? What's their role? You know, sometimes like as an administrator, sometimes it's just letting those administrators know, hey, you know what? Give John a high five next time you see him because here's what he's been doing. He's no longer skipping the contextual problems on his assessments he's at least putting pen to paper and, or pencil to paper for those who love to have pencil in the math classroom, but he's putting that to utensil to the paper at least to make some kind of attempt. Ooh, that's a start. Let's keep moving, let's keep moving. So I have a question. I work with schools that already have um, protocols in place for data protocols. Um, and they're they're sometimes somewhat stringent, just that they are already you know that we've always done it this way. What would you suggest to a leader um, to actually you know to ask questions about it or to think about how to train the teachers that they serve or other staff to do a a better job of it of the data discussions. What would you what would be some suggestions? Well, I, I would think of the, about the use of a, a data protocol that's already been provided, one that's been there for a while, or one that a district is saying, okay, you have to use this now. Um, and I always look through this lens of a continuous improvement cycle. So one, what's the purpose of this data protocol? 
What are the components that are there? And me as the teacher, me as the teacher team, out of the components and what's there, try to find at least one thing that I'd say, okay, that right there is something I, I would love to talk about and love for us to have our conversation in. I would love to focus in on it. It's got to be at least one thing on that data protocol when you can stand up and say, okay, let's level in on that part. Let's focus our conversation there. How does that fit in with what I'm, what my needs are as a teacher to support me with supporting my students? How do I take that protocol and not just rush through it or make it a checklist, but how do I take ownership of something related to that that's a part of that protocol? Um, it might be, yes, you have to show and document and go through each part of it. Boom, 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 boom. But where am I going to go? Boom, hold, pause, wait. Ooh, this is where, where we push in. Find that in that protocol. Um, and that's where you push in. That's where you get your richness and your rich conversations around. Um, it has to be meaningful to you. If nothing in those components of that protocol are meaningful to you, um, then I would offer and, and have you think through as teachers, how do you be, how do you exercise your teacher leadership working with your administrator? And if opportunities open themselves up for you to work with your district to say, hey, let's look at this protocol. What is it doing? What is it not doing for us? And why? Give you reasons why. And, and think about one of the components that you might like to substitute and bring that to people's attention. Don't say, boom, we're not going to do the whole protocol, but think through one F, one space in it where you can make an, a slight adjustment. And you might be able to just make that slight adjustment, show the evidence of what's happening and how it makes it richer for y'all, and then share that with others and let the numbers talk. You said something really important there. How does it make it richer for you? When you think about data itself it can't just be about you know here's here's where the current reality is so okay like it's the net okay now what right like you want that's like so so it has to be meaningful for me as a teacher or a leader is that is what how does this tell a story of where we're, our reality is and now what do we do with it right so if there's no action coming from our our discussion around student learning then it's it's just a data protocol, right? I think that's what you're, the, this, this idea of starting with the strengths and then going from there is it, it has to be richer. The, the di data dialogue process has to be richer for you. I commend it, it's, it. Yeah. Def, it's gotta be a process that you believe, um, one, uh, John said something earlier about ownership that you take ownership of. In other words, when I was in the classroom, I owned my students' data. When And I used to teach middle school through high school. When I was an AP calculus teacher, I took it personally when students did not perform well um, on an, the AP test, either calculus or statistics. Why? Because I saw the financial obligation there. I saw not only did they have to pay for the test or someone had to pay for it, but it also could set them up for not having to take some credits, some courses when they went off to college. So when you take ownership, of the data, then you believe that you can go about um, putting processes in place, putting structures in place, putting supports in place for your students, shifting and adjusting your teaching and learning. And the teaching part might be what you're doing, but some learning practices of what students can do and teaching them. You take ownership of, hey, this might be where it is, but this is where it's going. This is the story we want to tell. So Mona, your, your statement about telling a story, we all have the power to change the narrative is, are we willing enough to be bold enough and take those steps to go forth and change the narrative? And so take your steps and make your move. Yeah. Now, John, thinking about changing the narrative and thinking about the progress and process frequency of, of data conversations, I, you made me start to think about suggestions that you might have um, to leaders about how they might collect data on data conversations, right? Like what would they monitor? What things should they look for? Maybe some things to keep in mind as they, you know, track status of, of, of that, uh, that initiative. Any thoughts about that? That's a good question, John. Um, here's what I would say. Let's, let's take it a unit at a time. And this is where I, I say, let me start at a unit. 
I'm thinking about this unit that my teachers are going to go teach. I'm thinking about what conversations they will have that relate to and connect to any data choices that they make throughout. How are they going to utilize the prior knowledge that they know about students? That's a data point right there. Maybe it's a prior knowledge that I collected informally just from their interaction in previous units and experiences or anything along those lines. How did they identify some key tasks that they elevated in the classroom that they gathered information from? Not just exit tickets, but it could have been this task that we were using today. What formative assessments did they bring in that they as a team wanna have some brief conversations around? A data discussion, if we look at it, a brief, I think my biggest learning experiences were when I would, in the middle of hall duty or something um, with my department chair, just mention something about, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm teaching this concept, da, 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 you got any quick thoughts? You know, in between dropping by the office, he's there and we, next thing you know, we're talking for 15, 20 minutes. So that wasn't a hall duty, but that was in between an impromptu. Now, I'm not saying data discussions become these impromptus where you're always just laying it out there. But when, if I'm looking at it as a leader, what are the conversations that teachers can be engaged in as they go throughout the unit? What's the frequency of those? You know, because you know how students are doing as they go throughout the unit. You don't need to get to the end of the unit or you shouldn't have to get to the end of the unit to determine that what you taught the first week of a six week unit, your students still needed additional support, re-engagement, distributive practice on throughout the unit. You know that early enough. And so the parts I would look at as a leader is looking at what are the conversations that my teachers are having prior to going into the unit as they're setting up and they're planning their lessons? What key points within the unit are am I going to collect data and connect data points? And I say connect because what am I bringing about my students' funds of knowledge, which is their family background, culture, and all that kind of stuff? How am I bringing their strengths into it and building from that? Oh, look at these opportunities they expose. And then, so my conversation is during, and then at the end of that unit, what's my conversations? Ooh, when I look at the end of the unit conversation, what's my lesson plan story tell me? What's my reflection on my lesson plan story tell me? Because if I'm doing reflection on my lessons, I'm recognizing that in the middle of the unit, wow, we had a whole bunch of stuff going on, just school, community. Whew, that might be something I know I need to revisit later on. So when I get the end of unit results and we're talking about it, I already recognize that those types of items that show up based on that time frame, hmm, you know, I need to, I might already, I should already have a plan coming in, an idea of where I think my students are going to excel on, do well, show up where my students might struggle a little bit. And in some places where I'm sort of, and a lot of it is reflecting on my lesson plans and how they connect into what happened, what I taught. Oh, my students really got it to this, this topic. Why? Because I did an engaging task with them. They were all engaged in conversations all over the place, really getting it. And they really walked away and took it to heart and took a, a understanding, the learning transferred with them because they were actively engaged. Oh, they didn't do well on this one, why? Because I went procedural on them. Psh, here's step one, <laughs> step two, step three. You know, the kids Love who that. got, the kids who are more procedural, they got it. The ones who aren't, they're still under trying to figure out the conceptual understanding, the why it works. Okay, I messed up on that. I didn't use the algebra tiles that day. I didn't use, you know, counter two colored chips or one colored chips or something like that. I didn't use my manipulatives. So. Yeah. So one last question as we kind of wrap up this session, um, you know, as we look to this new school year after two years of disrupted learning experiences, what would you suggest that we as leaders keep in mind to ensure that we are being mindful of the way we're using data and making sure that we're using it in a way that that doesn't um, promote more barriers or limit access to meaningful mathematics? What would be some suggestions? Um, here, here's what I would like us to really to think about. Um, some of the, the, the um, 
some of what some of what data shows us now, if you go look at data, existed prior to COVID and the pandemic and the disruptions and interruptions in schooling and everything. So we knew we still had work. To, we had work to do then. You'd have students sitting in your classroom for a whole year, and at the end of the year, you recognize why they needed more. Um, so we know we had to do that heavy lift then, and that lift has probably might be the same level. It's just that we might have more students engaged with needing that kind of support. Is one, don't pretend like this is new and it's just been brought on because of the disruptions and interruptions in schooling over the last two years. Um, so one, don't make assumptions about what your students don't know about the mathematics. Mm -hmm. I would say, think about what they might bring to the classroom. Think about them um, their experiences, think about the math they've been engaged in, think about how you activate prior knowledge, think about how you can engage students um, with helping uplift some of the, the, the skill sets and the knowledge that's needed for the lesson that you're going to teach that day or across those days. And then do all that you can every single day to focus on grade level mathematics. And when I say focus on grade level mathematics, if I'm teaching a fourth grade class or a fifth grade class, I need to recognize, and this has been the case for years, I need to recognize just because I think I'm teaching fifth grade or I'm teaching algebra one, all of my students don't come to the classroom with that knowledge front and center of the prerequisites. How do I unpack it for them? How do I activate it for them? How do I help them remember? Or how do I re-engage them? And then in some cases, how do I recognize that, wow, they didn't get this last year? Because I know the time frames of when different things were happening, and thus this might have been skipped for some reason. And so how do I really push in on the grade level mathematics um, and recognize that in chunks, I need to rebuild, in chunks, I need to help support my students, in chunks. And I need to focus on the critical math for that grade level, not spreading all throughout, not recognizing that every single standard by itself makes up the critical math, but the critical math come to you in big concepts. And what are those that my students need to go so that they can be, be better off as they continue on their math continuum? Uh, I thank you so much for your conversation this evening. It's got lots of wheels spinning, thinking about what, what needs to happen next year. Just thank you so much for sharing your experience with Rethinking Data Conversations. And we enjoyed having you this evening. Well, glad to have me. I'm mean, glad to be here with you. <laughs> glad to have you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing that was good. you ever hear on the podcast right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. We hope you have been inspired by this bold mathematics leadership conversation and will tune into our podcast series each month. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. You can learn more about NCSM Leadership in Mathematics Education and our upcoming professional learning events on the NCSM website at mathedleadership.org. You can also follow NCSM on Twitter at mathedleaders using the hashtag NCSMBold. Thanks again.